again, we're one, one speaker away from lunch. And, and again, thank you to the speakers for helping keep us on time. Um, our uh, uh, talk for the morning is by Dr. Brian Mittman. Um, Brian is a senior scientist at Kaiser Permanente Department of Research and Evaluation and has additional affiliations at the University of Southern California as well as uh, UCLA. Um, at UCLA, he co-leads the Clinical and Transitional Science Institute Implementation and Improvement Science Initiative. And um, for our last talk um, this morning, he's going to be talking about the challenges in evaluating organizational interventions. So please welcome Dr. Mittman. I assume one of these buttons is what I need to advance. Yes. Got it. Yep. Uh, so my uh, goal is to, um, in some ways, provide an antidote to uh, one of Jose's uh, uh, comments on uh, uh, ignoring complexity, because I'd like to encourage us all to confront complexity and confront uh, adaptation. Uh, although it's not a goal, at least one consequence of this talk in the past, uh, adding a bit of stress. Uh, or perhaps excitement and enthusiasm, depending on how you interpret uh, uh, the internal uh, psychological arousal, if I remember my Psych 101. Uh, anyway, I'd like to um, uh, talk about some challenges in evaluating organizational interventions and basically um, uh, argue that um, uh, oftentimes our evaluations are not very useful for policy practice or for research purposes. And the reason is that too often we're asking the wrong questions and we're using the wrong methods to ask those questions or uh, using methods that don't answer the questions that we should be asking. So um, if we think about uh, what it is we're trying to support by way of uh, you know, policy and practice decisions and decision makers as researchers studying organizational interventions, uh, oftentimes uh, we try to answer simple questions such as is it effective or does it work? Uh, our colleagues who have the um, luxury uh, and simplicity of evaluating drugs uh, clearly focus on these kinds of questions. Uh, they try to support an FDA decision as to whether a drug should be approved or not, or if it should be funded, uh, if it should be included in the formulary. Even practicing physicians oftentimes look to research and so-called evidence-based practice to, uh, look to the, uh, uh, look for an answer to the question, should I use drug X? Is it effective? And uh, oftentimes we ask the same kinds of questions of our organizational interventions. Now, when we do have um, uh, the luxury, as I said, of uh, asking and answering the question, is intervention uh, X effective, we know very well how to approach that. Uh, we were all well trained in, uh, as doctoral students or uh, fellows uh, in uh, designing, conducting RCTs, focusing on uh, impacts and effectiveness and outcomes, whether uh, intervention A is better than placebo or intervention X is better than intervention Y. We randomize, we measure outcomes, uh, we focus on impact, and we often develop a, a good, strong, clear answer uh, to that question. Uh, the question, does it work or is it effective or is A better than B? Uh, again, we know that for many drugs, we can ask and answer that question in a relatively straightforward and strong manner. Uh, but when we deal with organizational interventions in the broader class of complex health interventions, which I'll define in a moment, uh, oftentimes that question is meaningless. Uh, you know, to ask whether organizational intervention A is better than B uh, just doesn't make sense because the answer nine times out of ten, if not 99 out of 100, is it depends or sometimes. Uh, and obviously that's not a very satisfactory answer. Now there are some uh, complex uh, health interventions that are highly robust uh, where we can conclude through research that by and large this seems to be effective under a broad range of circumstances. But I would assert that those complex health interventions are the exception rather than the rule. And as I said, more often than not, the complex health interventions that we study, the organizational interventions, just don't have a highly robust uh, uh, property of effectiveness. And again, it doesn't make sense for us to ask, is this effective? Complex health interventions haven't been defined in a, a, a consensus-based manner, but these tend to be the characteristics that uh, characterize these um, uh, interventions. And uh, obviously, organizational interventions uh, meet um, all of these characteristics. Multiple uh, components, they tend to interact. Uh, the organizational interventions and other complex health interventions tend to address multiple targets at multiple levels. One of the key characteristics is the adaptability. When we study a drug, it comes from the factory in a very uh, uh, stable formulation. When we deploy organizational interventions and other complex health interventions, irrespective of any efforts to try to maintain fidelity, they're not stable, they're not consistent. They change over time, they change from place to place. 
and they can be changed and should be changed, and I'll, uh, I'll get back to that issue in a moment. Uh, but the, the last point is important as well, the fact that these interventions don't have very simple, uh, uh, straightforward, uh, uh, short causal effects. They tend to have effects on a number of intermediate or mediating uh, uh, variables, and they uh, hence uh, affect other variables, and we need to recognize and understand and study that complexity. So to show some of the implications of this, uh, and I have two uh, hypothetical um, uh, uh, results from studies. Uh, these are histograms uh, for an um, organizational performance, organizational intervention study. I don't know that any of us have ever uh, generated findings that look like this, where the intervention sites did clearly better than the control sites. Um, uh, but uh, if we do have a robust intervention like this, it does make sense to ask the question, is it effective, should I use it? Because the answer is clearly yes. The intervention sites improved significantly, the control sites are clustered around zero. This is what we see more often when we deal with organizational interventions, uh, implementation interventions, health promotion programs. And I would not feel comfortable as a researcher dealing with decision makers telling them to use my highly innovative intervention, even if there is a small intervention control difference here because they're just as likely to end up uh, with significant harm uh, in the intervention group as they are to end up with significant benefit in the control group. And again, the assertion is that this is the pattern of results that we see for most organizational interventions and other complex health interventions. So what do we do with this? The answer, of course, is that we don't try to support the dichotomous binary yes-no decisions. We don't try to answer the question, is it effective or does it work? or which is more effective, because again, the answer is always it depends or sometimes. Instead, we should be understanding how these interventions work and developing guidance for practice rather than developing evidence with a capital E in the normal way that we think about evidence. We should be focusing not on measuring outcomes and impact, but instead focusing on process, studying explicitly the mediators and moderators, the mechanisms of effect, uh, study embracing adaptation rather than suppressing it and trying to understand how to manage context. There are a number of reasons that complex health interventions don't show robust, consistent uh, effects. Uh, uh, the intervention targets themselves tend to be highly heterogeneous and the settings are heterogeneous. We have a saying in VA as well as Kaiser, you've seen one VA, you've seen one VA. The same intervention that works in uh, uh, Kaiser Site A is not likely to work in Kaiser Site B because the sites are very different. The underlying pathologies, the root causes of the performance problems are very different. We're studying HPV vaccination performance in Southern California. We have a lot of 50% performing sites. Many of those sites, though, have low performance because the physicians and nurses aren't doing what they can. If they provided a strong recommendation, the patients uh, often follow uh, medical advice. There are other places where the nurses are doing everything that they can and should. It's the patients and the parents who are resistant. And obviously, physician interventions are unlikely to be effective in the latter category, although they are in the former. So the problems differ, and as a consequence, the interventions need to differ. And as I said, the interventions themselves change. The content changes. These are not consistent pills. These are complex social interventions that are highly adaptable, and they can be adapted, and they should be adapted. And we should be embracing and studying and ultimately trying to guide adaptation rather than what we were taught to do as grad students, and that is to suppress adaptation in high rates of fidelity or to ignore adaptation and assume that it will all wash out in the end. There is actually an answer to the question, can you have adaptation and fidelity simultaneously? And the answer is yes, by using the adaptation algorithm, which I won't talk about much in the interest of time, but um, I can uh, discuss it in a, a question period. So what do we do, again, with complex health interventions? Uh, the analogy that uh, works for me, at least, is to view our complex health interventions, our organizational interventions, as the mousetrap game that many of us remember from our childhood. If all you do is focus on the beginning, where you drop the marble, and the end where the uh, trap drops, uh, if it does, you have no way of knowing why it doesn't drop. And we can adapt these interventions, since we can modify them, if we were to under the mechanisms of effect and focus on the process, we would understand how to strengthen these interventions and how to adapt them in the future. Again, we should be studying and guiding adaptation rather than suppressing it. There's some other implications as well, including uh, the one that I'll deal with briefly, and that is to um, rethink and perhaps even eliminate um, use of the concept of core components 
and instead turn to with, uh, uh, the concepts of core functions and forms. Now, many of these points come from the Vukori Method Standards for Complex Health Interventions, which I hope you're all familiar with. Uh, that's actually the cause of a lot of stress on the part of Vukori applicants, and we're dealing with that now, trying to develop a, a rich uh, collection of resources to provide examples of, and guidance on how to use these, in addition to developing some training programs. But let me go through a couple of them in detail. Uh, one of them is uh, the need to specify an explicit causal model. You know, again, uh, just looking at inputs and outputs is not useful. What we need to understand, excuse me, need to understand is the mechanisms of effect and the contextual factors. You know, there's an argument that's been made in the quality improvement literature that um, uh, when we're dealing with quality improvement as an organizational intervention, the actual intervention itself doesn't make much difference. It doesn't matter which intervention you select. If you're dealing with a hospital or a clinic with strong leadership and a quality-oriented culture and good stable staff and you know, good budget support, you can actually throw any QI intervention or organizational intervention at that site and they'll manage to improve quality. Whereas a site without all of those strengths, you can give that site the best so-called evidence-based quality improvement intervention they won't make any progress. You know, the clinical equivalent is to say if a patient presents with a certain chronic disease, it actually doesn't matter which medication you prescribe. What matters is if that patient has a, a stable home life and a supportive spouse and a good job, lives in a safe neighborhood, good diet and exercise. All of those contextual factors for clinical outcomes are important, but there's still a significant main effect of the intervention, of the medication. The argument says that for many organizational interventions, the main effect is close to zero. It's the contextual factors that are more important. And even if the main effect isn't zero, it's highly dependent on uh, you know, contextual factors and the way that those uh, components uh, play out. So specifying the causal model of any organizational intervention and then collecting and analyzing data that allow us to understand how it achieves its effects rather than whether it achieves its effects is uh, uh, one of the key implications of these standards. I mentioned the function form distinction and, and the idea that we shouldn't be talking about core components. Any complex health intervention has a series of components or activities, but oftentimes those activities are very arbitrary. They're based on the needs and the circumstances of the sites that happen to be involved in the study, led to the so-called evidence-based manualized intervention. Uh, Penelope Hall introduced this distinction a number of years ago. It hasn't been picked up nearly as much as the Pori Methodology Committee argues it should be, uh, but the distinction is between the underlying purpose of an intervention activity. If we have a manualized intervention that specifies 20 minutes of walking three days a week, the walking is arbitrary. It's physical activity that we're trying to uh, encourage. Patient education, I alluded to this uh, uh, indirectly with the TV example. We know that for certain patients, HPV vaccination education delivered by physicians is likely to be counterproductive. You know, the patients assume that this is just the drug company speaking. In some cases, patient education by nurses or by peers would be more effective. So again, to specify in a manualized intervention all of the detailed uh, procedures or forms of an intervention is oftentimes counterproductive. We need to step back, the underlying needs that we're trying to address specify the core functions, and then develop a menu of forms and ideally provide guidance as to which form to select in order to adapt the intervention. So this is one of the key uh, recommendations as part of this collection of uh, PCORI complex health intervention uh, uh, recommendations or standards. So I talked about uh, the questionable value of manualized interventions, at least as we typically think of a manual, as a very detailed list of steps. Uh, you know, the only thing that we can be guaranteed in most cases when we take a manualized intervention developed in one setting and shown to be effective and imported into another is that you won't achieve the same effects. Again, the manual is designed by and for a specific set of settings, and other settings are different. That manual is not likely to be appropriate. Uh, replacing a focus on core components with core functions, um, uh, this has implications for fidelity. Uh, you know, 20 minutes of physician education, uh, if that's not the appropriate form of education, uh, what appears to be a low fidelity uh, delivery of the intervention actually may be higher fidelity to the core function. If you have the uh, peer provide 15 minutes of education, 
not following the manual in lieu of the physician or nurse providing two 20-minute um, uh, sessions, that peer may be more effective in conveying knowledge. Uh, so again, rethinking the way that we uh, conceptualize and measure fidelity is important. Uh, but ultimately, uh, you know, it gets down to the point that I made uh, in the beginning. We have to rethink the purpose of research on complex health interventions such as organizational interventions. The focus is not on uh, estimating average effect size uh, in developing evidence as we typically think of it, but instead on developing guidance and understanding and insights. Here's some of the methods that we need to be uh, using to a much greater extent, um, uh, and this is not all about uh, uh, qualitative process evaluation, but there are many uh, quantitative methods as well. We need much more mediation analyses. Uh, Greg Ahrens has some nice work that uh, illustrated this for implementation. Uh, we need to, again, study explicitly uh, media mediation moderators and mechanisms. Uh, there are a number of qualitative methods, of course, which are uh, useful and need to be included uh, alongside the quantitative methods. Uh, but just stepping a bit, um, you know, the overall approach that's recommended by these standards is that we begin by specifying our complex health intervention or organizational intervention and its underlying uh, uh, causal uh, mechanisms of effect. We identify the core functions in a menu of forms. We develop adaptation algorithms so that we actually provide guidance to sites as to which form they should select from the menu. And then we attempt to understand not whether these interventions are effective, but instead how they're effective, how we can modify them to make them more effective. Essentially, how do you modify the chemical composition of the intervention to increase its effectiveness? And how do we uh, modify the context uh, to improve effectiveness if it turns out that the main effect of the intervention is close to zero on average and all of the action, so to speak, is in the context. Uh, so very different uh, ideas and purposes for research, but um, uh, this is what I would argue based on the uh, PCORI method standards and others uh, as to what we should be doing. And I think I may have left uh, a few minutes for discussion and, and uh, complaints and alternative opinions. Brian, it's Brian. Uh, Brian Weiner from the University of Washington. Love hearing you talk about this topic. Every time you present it, it stimulates new thoughts. So I'm going to ask you new questions. Um, uh, well, one is an observation. The point you made about uh, causal models and the importance of those, I think, just underscores where organization theory and research can sure. play a role because we need both a theory of the intervention as well as a theory of the context. And I think mm -hmm. organizational uh, theory can actually contribute to both of those. Sure. Let me ask the question, though, is about uh, if we accept and even permit uh, very, uh, adaptation in these mm -hmm. complex interventions, um, how do we accommodate that in our research studies where we are trying to compare two things that are the same? Um, if, in fact, there's going to be variation from one health system to the next as to how what this complex intervention looks sure. like. I'm guessing you're going to say focus on forms, not then functions. Vice versa, but yes. As far as functions, not forms. Um, but again, that sort of presumes that at least the functions are preserved uh, and the adaptations don't change those. Yeah, so that's, that's the point of the alternative way of thinking about fidelity. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, you know, we sometimes say at Kaiser Southern California that uh, the form function distinction solves all problems. You know, the idea is to specify the core functions for any intervention and to develop the menu of, of forms and to measure fidelity to function. And the way that we conduct our empirical research is ideally there is a strong statistical association between uh, level of fidelity to the core functions and outcomes and effectiveness. There's a problem, though, which is that if you choose a form to operationalize a function that's the wrong form, Ideally, you would know that, and that would lead to a low measure of fidelity, but we don't always know which form is better or worse. So we basically have a two-step empirical uh, challenge or, or um, a goal. Uh, one is to you know, test uh, the appropriateness of the core functions and whether we have the correct list, but the other is develop empirical evidence suggesting which forms are better or worse for which settings. Uh, and, and, you know, how that is done is, is uh, you know, sometimes in the Quarry Methodology Committee, we say that's not our problem. We think this is the right way to go about it, but exactly how this agenda will be conducted given, the, you know,
very large number of possible forms and variations is a challenge. That's why NCI is here to uh, support this kind of work. Sarah Birkin, University of North Chapel Hill. That actually teed me up perfectly to ask my question, which is inspired by your talk, Brian, but also more directed to the folks at NCI about um, funding opportunities. So PCORI has the improving methods um, sure. announcement. But I'd love to see something. I know we're going to set aside time later to talk about funding opportunities and how to inspire some of this research. But a lot, you know, as the questions have been suggesting, a lot of this work is really under development. Mm -hmm. The approaches to threading these needs are, they haven't been developed yet, so sure. we need yeah. to develop these methods. And so I'd just like to make a plug for thinking about, you know, what, how we can um, fund this work and what the the respective roles are of NCI versus PCORI versus other agencies. And in uh, you know the P50s and the implementation science area, support for methods development. But I think other opportunities for that kind of work um, you know, are important. Uh, I'll take opportunity for an inappropriate plug to a methods conference that we're hoping both NCI and uh, the ARCBL fund that will provide some guidance in identifying some of the methods development issues. Uh, you know that I really would inform PCORI's. Uh, uh, agenda, but also NCI as well. My question is a conversation we were having at a break, and, and you actually dealt very well with one issue which we were talking about, which was this kind of the form versus function yeah. and kind of adapting to a specific setting um, and intervention. But but I think inherent to a lot of what you were saying is this very that there are these very kind of complex interactions going on by multiple factors is kind of, uh, we're also dealing with in the context of these, where we're intervening at an organizational level, we currently have a small n. Mm -hmm. So to kind of tease apart these kind of very complex relationships in the context of having that small n, how do you deal with it as you kind of try to think about how to design sure. studies that, that look at an organization? Yeah, so that's another challenge that falls into the category I mentioned earlier of, uh, you know, not our problem. But um, so, so obviously, uh, you know, and, and, you know Shouldn't really say it that way, but you know these are considerable challenges, and uh, you know the, the need for new methods development, um, you know, is, is you know clearly indicated. You know we have some ability within VA with 150 medical centers and 1,000 clinics. Uh, you know as we combine different uh, integrated delivery systems, uh, but but again it's a, it's a problem, and uh, you know we know that there's sort of a trade-off between uh, uh, you know sample size. Uh, uh, and, and your ability to delve deeply, and it may be that there are some quantitative and qualitative methods for process evaluation that will give us insights into the mechanisms of effect, despite the lack of, uh, you know, enough sites to show us statistical associations at the higher level. But I think, again, the best short answer is, uh, you know, good question, we need to get to work on it. Greg Aarons. Um, one is, you know, we think about these complex settings, um, and so think about the interventions that are needed. Sometimes it can be very simple. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking of a study by Dov Zohar, uh, where the goal was to improve safety climate in mm -hmm. manufacturing, uh, and what they did in this randomized trial was to uh, assess the degree to which um, leaders talk about safety, so have mm -hmm. their staff report how much are talking about safety, sure. feed that information back to the leaders. That was the whole intervention. Um, mm -hmm. Talk about safety increased, safety climate increased, accidents decreased. So sometimes I'm, I'm hoping I can do some of those. <laughs> <laughs> but then I think the other, in terms, in terms of kind of adaptability and flexibility, we've been having this discussion a lot about what's adaptation, what's tailoring. So the low side that I talked about is designed to be tailored, and so we tailor for each organization, each team. What I think we don't do is implement it uh, nearly as well as we should. So maybe you can talk about you know that piece, how we might kind of document adaptation tailoring. Yeah, and in, in uh, Chan Wilsey Sturman, uh, you know, incorporated some of this in her newest iteration of uh, you know the uh, uh, adaptation framework. You know, I think it gets back to the core function issue. That we need to understand. So, in the case that you know your example, I think the core function is to um, raise the perceived importance of uh, you know safety. Having leaders uh, you know deliver messages is 
one form, but it may be that the, the leaders actually have a poor reputation, getting back to my HPV example, and it's better to have uh, you know, union uh, leaders or other frontline workers. So I think understanding what the core function is and what we're trying to achieve and recognizing that there are alternative paths that we can take to carry out that function, that's the, you know, the way to think about tailoring. One other quick comment, which is, um, you know, I think uh, you know, there's a lot of consensus around the idea that core components is a term that we need to um, stop using because it's misleading. You know, I've argued that we should stop using adaptation and the reason is that oftentimes we have the so-called manualized evidence-based intervention that's viewed as sort of the base version and then we have to adapt away from it if that's what you mean by adaptation then that's I think the wrong way to think about it we have a set of core functions and we need to operationalize or tailor those for different purposes and the version that we sometimes view as the base version is one arbitrary uh, you know instantiation of that list of core functions so not using that as a starting point and adapting away from it, but using the core functions as a starting point and tailoring. So you know, it depends on what we mean by adaptation, but I think that distinction in that way of, of recognizing the limited importance of the first version of the uh, intervention, uh, I think is, is important. One more, Jessica. Hi, Jessica Chubak, Kaiser Permanente. It seems to me that a form could um, come from a menu of several different functions. Mm -hmm. And so I sure. guess one question that I have is, you know, you think you're addressing A, right. so you have form one or form two, you choose form two, it's actually in addition to addressing function sure. A, also addressing function B. So how do you know which function you're actually testing? So I think that the broad point is that there's a one to many and a many to one. And uh, you know, the best example that I'm aware of is um, uh, the, um, uh, so-called core component of the quality improvement collaborative breakthrough series that is local quality team data collection and analysis. So when you think about the steps in the quality improvement collaborative, you know, these teams get together, they go to learning sessions, they go back to their home institutions, they collect and analyze data. That's a specific activity or component. The problem is that it operationalizes two separate functions, and if you don't recognize that, you end up making mistakes that apparently were made at the VA. I don't know if this is true, but what, what I heard was that VA decided to centralize the data collection and analysis task. You know, most quality improvement collaboratives are a disparate set of uh, institutions. They all have their own data systems. You can't, uh, uh, you know, achieve any economies of scale as you can in VA where everybody uses the same data system. So rather than have every local team conduct its own data collection and analysis, they offload it or delegate it to a central team. That's fine to carry out one of the core functions for that particular activity, which is getting answers. You know, you want to see how you're performing and, and you know, where the quality gaps are. But it completely destroys the other core function, which is to allow the local team to gather some insights and develop some tacitness by getting their hands dirty, so to speak, with data collection analysis. And if you delegate responsibility based on a overly simplistic understanding of what that intervention is all about, you, you know, essentially have low fidelity to that other function. So, uh, you know, again, it gets back to being very careful about identifying the core functions and what the intervention is trying to achieve, thinking about all the different ways that are available to achieve it, and selecting those that actually truly fulfill the core function as opposed to completely destroying it. That's pretty good. So thank you, Brian. Uh